There seems to be a lot of confusion around pneumatic valves and fittings. By the time we're done here today, that'll either be better or much, much worse. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Some of you are aware that I uploaded a short-lived video a couple of weeks ago about pneumatic valves and it received a, let's say, spirited response. We're gonna take another run at that topic today and see if we can't clear some things up. The reason I'm looking at pneumatic valves is because I'm installing a new spindle on my CNC mill that uses a pneumatic automatic tool changer and it uses compressed air to release the pull stud so that the tool can come out and you can put another one in quickly and easily. It also uses compressed air to purge the case of the spindle so there's constantly air flowing out through the spindle nose seals to keep debris from getting into the bearings. And I'm also gonna put a fog buster on the machine and I'll wanna be able to switch the compressed air for that on and off automatically under control of the uh, CNC program. And so for all three of those, what I need is an electrically controlled valve. And these are commonly referred to as solenoid valves or solenoid valves. Apparently people on the internet disagree about how that should be pronounced. I'm not really interested in a solder versus solder conversation, but um, just understand that that's what they're called. Solenoid valves is how I'll pronounce it. And there are three basic types that you will run into. Uh, the first one is what's commonly referred to as a 2-2 valve. And that means that it has two ports, an inlet and an outlet port, and it has two positions. In the case of a 2-2 valve, it's either on or off. And every valve should come with a diagram that describes the functionality of the valve and how it works. And we can talk through how to read these diagrams. So this is a diagram for a 2-2 valve. And the first thing to note is there are two boxes. And these two boxes denote the two different states that the valve can be in. Now in this case, there's two ports, one labeled P and one labeled A. P is the pressure inlet usually, and A is usually the first output, or in this case, the only output. And this arrow denotes that in this state, the air is allowed to go from the P port out through the A port. In the other state of the valve, the state is, it is closed and both of these ports are blocked. So air can't flow either direction through the valve. So the valve, these are the, so you have the two ports and the two different states it can be in, hence a 2-2 valve. The symbols on the side of these tell you how these different states are activated. This rectangle with a slash through it is an electric solenoid, and so that's the electromagnet that is mounted here on the top of the valve. And this symbol on the other side is a spring that's inside the valve. So when this solenoid is active, when there's current flowing through the electromagnet, this state of the valve will be selected so that air can move from the P port to the A port, the valve is open, and when the solenoid is turned off, the spring returns the valve to this state where it's completely blocked. And so this is kind of the simplest valve you're gonna see, and that's exactly what you'd expect if you just pick this thing up. You connect your air inlet to the in port and the outlet to the out port, and when you turn on the current, the air flows. When you turn off the current, it stops. Now this kind of valve is perfect for something like uh, an air purge or something like the, uh, the fog buster that's just gonna be blowing air and coolant onto the workpiece because all you have to do is start and stop the airflow. But if you're gonna do something more complex, like run a drawbar or run a pneumatic cylinder, then you're gonna to need to worry about exhaust. Now this is a double acting pneumatic cylinder, which has two ports. If you apply air to one port, it extends. And if you apply air pressure to the other port, it retracts. Now this is a double acting cylinder, meaning you can apply pressure to push or pull. You'll also see single acting cylinders that only have pressure connected up to one side. So when you apply pressure, it extends. And then when you take the pressure away, a spring causes it to retract automatically. So there's no power on the return stroke. It just returns under spring pressure. However, you can't just turn off the air 
In this case, I have extended it and I've closed the valves. So there's no more air pressure, but I still can't push this back because in order to push this back, the air has to be able to flow back out of this port. So until I actually vent it to the atmosphere, it can't return. And so that's what the next kind of valve we're gonna talk about here does. This is referred to as a 3-2 valve because it has three ports, one, two, three, and it runs in two positions. Now there's a very, very tiny, tiny little picture on the side of this. Let's see if I can get this where you can see it. So there's a little symbol on the side here that shows the operation of the valve, but that's really small. I have a bigger version of it. And this is the 3-2 valve. So we've got our three ports, P, the pressure inlet port, and the A port for the pressure out. But then another has another port on here labeled R, and that's an exhaust port. So this valve also exists in two states, and it has a spring and a solenoid. So the normal state, if you don't have any air pressure on it, the spring returns it to this state, the pressure coming in is blocked. Then if you activate the solenoid, then it selects this state and allows the pressure to flow through to extend the cylinder. And when you turn off the magnet, it returns because of the spring to this state. The difference is, instead of just blocking the A port, the A port is connected to R, which is the exhaust port. So in this case, you turn it on, it extends the cylinder, you turn it off, and it allows the air to escape from the cylinder out the exhaust so that it can retract. So it extends, and then when you release the pressure, it opens this port back up, connects it to the exhaust, and the valve can be pushed, or this, the uh, cylinder can be pushed back by a spring. Now the third type of valve that you're probably gonna come across is what's called a 5-2 valve. And this has five ports, one, two, uh, three, four, five. And of course it has two positions, just like the other valves that we've looked at. And this is designed specifically for running a double acting cylinder. And the diagram for this valve looks like this. So we've got the five ports, the P for the pressure port, A and B for the two sides of the cylinder, and R and S, two exhaust ports. And again, it has two states. So normally, the spring returns it to this state where the pressure is connected to one end of the cylinder, either extending or retracting it, and the other end of the cylinder is exhausted to atmosphere so that it can move because the air has to be released from the other side of the cylinder in order for it to be able to move. Then when you activate the solenoid, it switches to the other state. So where the pressure was going to the A side, now the pressure will go to the B side. These aren't labeled. Um, I don't know why they don't label them. Uh, pressure goes to the B side, pushes the cylinder the other way, and the other end of the cylinder is open to the atmosphere. So you provide pressure in and uh, two exhaust ports and then these two hook to the two ends of the cylinder. Uh, one other thing on these diagrams, you'll see these little arrows here. Uh, it's easier to see, easier to see on this one. You'll see these arrows that are on the solenoid and on the spring end. Those indicate that it's a pilot valve. And what that means is that the electromagnet is not providing all of the force to throw the shuttle in the valve back and forth. It's also using air pressure to help. So the solenoid is actually just opening up a small valve that then allows air pressure to throw the large valve to the opposite position. And then when you turn that off, that little valve applies pressure to the other side and kicks the spool in the other direction uh, to open and close the valve. And so these valves require less current generally on the electromagnet, and they also move more rapidly. Many of these valves are rated to switch at five hertz, like five times per second, they can change position, which uh, I don't even want to think about what that is going to look like and sound like, but uh, apparently the valves can do that with the uh, pilot assist. So with the 5-2 valve, you can switch air pressure to the two sides of the piston. And then of course, what that looks like is one side causes it to extend, and then you apply pressure to the other end, it causes it to retract. And we will hook one of these up to one of these valves in a moment and show how that works. But before we can hook it up, we need to talk about the connections and the different types of fittings that are used to connect air to these valves. Now when we start talking about fittings, this is where the real confusion begins. The fittings that I like to use on pneumatic systems are what are called push to connect fittings. 
And here's an example of one. And the way this works is there's a brass body on this that threads into the port on the valve or on the compressor on whatever device you have that you want to connect air to. And then it has a hole and there's an O-ring down in there that will seal around the outside diameter of a plastic tube. In this case, it's quarter inch tube, but these come in uh, all different sizes, including metric and imperial sizes. And down inside there, there is an O-ring that makes that seal. There's also a spring washer with teeth that grips the outside diameter of the tube so that when you push it in, it goes through that spring all the way to the bottom and then it's held securely with the O-ring making the seal. And if you want to remove it, you just push in this plastic collar and it comes right out. Yeah, because when you press in the plastic collar, it depresses the fingers of the metal spring and releases the tube. And so in all of the situations that I have, I'm going to be putting these fittings into the valves and into the devices so that I can make the connections with quarter inch tubing. But as soon as we start talking about the threaded fittings, you'll note that all of the valves tend to have these threaded fittings on them. We have to start talking about the different kinds of threaded fittings and the kinds of threads that are used, taper versus parallel, different sizes, different standards, different thread pitches. And the best place to start is probably in the machinery's handbook. So the machinery's handbook, and this is an old edition. Let's see, which edition do I have? Mine's the 21st, which was 1979. And we'll go back here to the section on pipe fittings. And there are two main types that are addressed in this book. And those are American pipe threads and British standard pipe threads. And so if you see uh, designations like NPT or NPS, that stands for National Pipe Taper or National Pipe Straight Threading. And those are gonna be the imperial sizes that are generally used in the US. And to make it more confusing, the other kind that you're gonna run into commonly are called British pipe threads, which are also imperial sizes, but this is a British standard as opposed to an American standard. So let's take a little bit closer look at this. So these are the standard American pipe threads, and there's a helpful table here giving dimensions and characteristics of those threads. Now there are tapered and straight threads, we'll talk about that in a minute, but the two that I use most commonly are going to be quarter inch and eighth inch. And so for the eighth inch, there's a bunch of dimensions, but it is the thread on it is gonna be 27 threads per inch, and the quarter inch national pipe thread or national pipe taper is going to be 18 threads per inch. So those are 27 and 18 for the eighth inch and quarter inch, respectively. Now you'll note that the dimensions on these things, like the quarter inch, the outside diameter is 540 thousandths. That is way bigger than a quarter inch. And that's because this is intended to be an outside thread on a pipe with a quarter inch inside diameter. And uh, you know, today with the plastics and all different materials, those dimensions vary widely, but this is how the, this is where the spec came from. So for a quarter inch NPT, which is probably the most common you're gonna see in American pipe thread, those are 18 threads per inch. Now if we flip over here to the British pipe threads, you can see that we have the same kinds of designations. We've got eighth inch and quarter inch, but you'll note that the eighth inch is 28 threads per inch instead of 27, and the quarter inch is 19 threads per inch instead of 18. So the pitch of the threads is different between the American and the British pipe threads. So these are commonly called BSP, British Standard Pipe. And if they're tapered, they'll be BSPT. If they're straight, they'll be BSP, I think S, I don't have that right in front of me. And so the, uh, but the most important thing to figure out when you're trying to figure out what kind of fitting you need to go in your valve is, are you dealing with British pipe threads or are you dealing with American pipe threads? And there very well may be some other ones out there that are less common or even that are more common, but I haven't run into. But those are the most important ones that I've run into personally. And the best way to identify those is with a thread pitch gauge. So if you can uh, take your valve, 
In this case, I know because the valve had a proper spec on it that these are quarter inch NPT, which means they should be 18 threads per inch. I've got my 18 thread per inch leaf on my thread pitch gauge, and I can just feel in here, and it's very difficult to show on video, but I can just feel in here and I can tell that these are 18 threads per inch. And I've looked at this under a binocular microscope, that's the easiest way, or with a magnifying visor, and you can see that these are definitely 18 threads per inch. If they didn't measure 18 threads per inch and they were a little bit tighter, I would assume that they're BSP threads, or something else metric, but generally BSP threads, which would be 19 threads per inch for the quarter inch size. So those are the basics. There are a couple of other differences between the national pipe thread and the British pipe thread. The British pipe threads are actually Whitworth form threads that have a 55 degree angle on the crest and the national pipe threads have a 60 degree thread form. And that difference honestly isn't that important. The thread pitch is a bigger deal. And if you have the right pitch, you've probably got the right thread form, though it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are all kinds of unicorns out there with uh, different combinations that I'm not aware of. But these are the two you're most likely to come across. Now, in addition to the different sizes and the different thread pitches for the different standards, the threads are commonly made in tapered and parallel. And the common configurations that you're gonna see are a full tapered thread where the hole is threaded, it's tapered, and the fitting that's going into it is also tapered. And in this scenario, the thread pitches match, and as you first start to thread it in, because the end of the hole is larger and the end of the fitting is smaller, they'll be loose and there'll be space between the threads. And as you thread the fitting in deeper, it gets tighter and tighter until ultimately, all of the space between these closes up. Now there are what are called dry seal threads that have a very tight spec for exactly the flats on the top and the flats in the valleys or, or radii so that they will mate exactly with no sealant, but generally you see these with sealant. You'll note that these fittings actually have sealant pre-applied to the threads. This is some kind of a soft compound that as this tapered fitting screws in, that squeezes into the gaps in the threads, and as this gets tighter and tighter, it ultimately forms a seal. You can also wrap these uh, just bare fittings in uh, uh, Teflon tape, that's common. Different people have different opinions about how well that works. There's also uh, pipe dope, there's gas fitter, and there's a whole bunch of other products that are designed to seal this up either something that you put on that hardens or doesn't harden or some kind of tape or fiber material that packs in, but the idea being that as this goes in deeper, it gets tighter and you get a seal. The, another common thing that you'll run into are parallel threads, where the hole is completely parallel, not tapered, and the fitting is not parallel and not tapered. And in this scenario, the fitting does not seal into the end of the thread. The, at least on the threads, there is no seal. There are specs for these to be relatively tight for rigid mechanical joints. There are th specs for these to be relatively loose for mechanical joints that are easy to assemble and disassemble. And these are commonly intended for a face seal, and that's what's shown here. There's an O-ring in this fitting that seals against either a chamfer at the top of the hole or seals against the face. And sometimes there are rubber washers. And in the model engineering community, they often use these with copper washers that crush against the surface to make a steam tight seal for uh, a model steam engines and uh, steam plants. So you'll commonly see these, though I have not seen personally a valve with that configuration just because you've got things like these mounting holes that are so close in many cases to the surfaces that generally those face seals are going to have a hard time sealing, though it wouldn't surprise me if those are out there too. The third thing that you see sometimes that I personally don't prefer is a tapered male fitting going into a straight female hole. And so the way this works is it starts out loose and as you tighten it down, it gets tighter and tighter, but only at the top. And so you get metal to metal compression at the top of the thread that tries to form a seal. Now, because you don't have that over the entire length of the thread, like with the taper, 
it's much harder to get these to seal. And this is actually a scenario that I ran into in a previous video that is no longer up because of the spirited discussion it generated. But um, this is the situation that I had, and I was using Teflon tape trying to get these to seal and not, I was not able to get a good seal on it. Now, if you use uh, pipe dope or gas fitter or some other materials, I believe you probably could get these to seal just fine. It wasn't working for me and uh, I didn't want to go with that. What I wanted to use were the tapered fittings in the tapered threads and mostly just because these kinds of fittings are commonly available where I live. I can walk into any hardware store and buy these. So those are the most convenient for me and I've had the most luck with getting these to seal properly. Now, like I said, in a previous video, I had a set of these valves. I don't have them anymore. They went back to Amazon because I was not happy with the way they uh, sealed. And I was having a lot of trouble getting the fittings to seal. And if you saw that video, um, I'll eject a little clip here with uh, me trying to figure out why they weren't sealing and air bubbles escaping uh, when I put soapy water on them. And it took me a long time to figure out what was going on with these valves. And I think it's a little bit of an object lesson in you get what you pay for, or more like if you wanna save some money, you can, but you need to be aware of what you're getting into. In this particular case, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was going on. Now, these valves came with fittings, and the fittings that came in them were for metric tubing. These are push to connect fittings for six millimeter and eight millimeter metric tubing. That's not what I wanted to use, so I supplied my own fittings and tried to get them to seal. And in this case, after a lot of back and forth uh, in the comments, some contacts from a couple of guys who actually worked in the industry and have experience with the manufacturing methods for these valves and these kinds of fittings, and a lot of experimentation and measuring myself, here's what I think was going on with these valves, and I'm fairly certain of this. They had national pipe straight threads. So they were 18 thread per inch cylindrical straight threads in the valve body and they came with tapered fittings. But the tapered fittings that they provided were not national pipe fittings, they were BSP fittings. So they were 18 threads per inch in the valve body and they were 19 threads per inch on the fitting tapered. But because they're tapered and because they're a little bit smaller, they still screwed in. And this is part of where the spirited comment section came in that last video, is people were telling me that it was absolutely impossible to be able to thread that in, and the only reason that it possibly could have been that way is because I destroyed the threads by forcing the wrong fitting in there, and um, I just was trying to lie about it and cover up my mistake so that I wouldn't be embarrassed. And I, I honestly don't know where that came from, clearly from people who haven't watched many of my videos. I mean, just a couple videos ago, I admitted to making a mistake and letting the smoke out of a $3,000 spindle. So I'm not really sure why I would want to cover up damaging a $30 valve. But for the people that were absolutely convinced that you could not possibly have been putting a 19 thread per inch fitting into an 18 thread per inch hole until I damaged it, I went and put together a model in Fusion 360. Now, this is a model of a BSP tapered fitting into an NPS cylindrical threaded hole. Let me try to get this where you can see it better and you can see a little bit better what's going on here. So we've got a cylindrical thread and the tapered thread. And the reason that this works, even though you can see the threads line up pretty well here, but they become increasingly misaligned as we get deeper and deeper into the fitting. And that's because we've got 19 threads per inch on the fitting and 18 threads per inch on the body. The reason you're able to screw it in this far is because even though these threads are radically misaligned by the time we get this deep, because the diameter of the fitting is smaller, it doesn't actually interfere because it's riding up on the slope of that. These are 55 degree threads against 60 degree threads and the wrong pitch, but you can actually screw it all the way in before it finally rides up and interferes just about the time it contacts the face. So this is what I measured on the valves that I received from Amazon. And um, it is a little surprising to me that they came this way, but um, my understanding is that this is not that uncommon. And my advice would be when you're buying valves, especially when you're buying inexpensive valves, try to buy from a source where you can get a good specification of exactly what you're getting. In this case, it just said PT threads, as in pipe threads, which can mean a lot of different things. 
Um, and I would, if you want to use NPT, find valves that say quarter NPT or one eighth inch NPT, or specifically, you know, a fitting style that you have available and that you plan to use or that you can order to go with it. If you don't, uh, order the valves by all means. You want to save some money and then do a little work. Uh, do yourself a favor and grab a thread pitch gauge and figure out exactly what you're dealing with so you can get the right fittings and uh, make it work for your application. In my case, uh, I didn't want this. I wanted to use NPT threads on both sides, so I bought some new valves that I will use for the spindle project that have known uh, ports and known fittings, and I don't expect to have any trouble with those. Now, the last thing that I'll mention about valves is these kinds of valves are commonly uh, designed to, so that they can be placed on manifolds. If I had a whole bunch of these valves that I wanted to run, so I've got two ports, a port for pressure and a port for exhaust and a port to go to the cylinder or the device that's being switched. And if I had a whole bunch of these, then I got to have a bunch of fittings to separate my air and connect it to all of the valves. To make this easier, many uh, companies that make valves also make these manifolds. So this is just a piece of aluminum with holes that go the full length inside these little tunnels that with ports for the individual valves. So these valves, um, they come with gasket, little rubber gaskets and screws. So you put down a rubber gasket here and then mount the valve on top. And so you mount all the valves along on here and then that allows you to connect the pressure in one spot and the exhaust in one spot and then plug the other end, whichever end is convenient, or you can come off the other end and string multiple manifolds together. And that just allows you to have single connections to a whole bank of valves. So in this case, there's, uh, this is a 3-2 yeah, valve, so your, your uh, pressure and exhaust ports are here, and then the port out to the device is on the top. And you can stack these, and you can get these in all different lengths for all different sizes. Do make sure that you get the right manifold for the right valve, and the documentation will show that. When I ordered these, I actually ended up with a manifold that was too small the first time that was for a different valve series, so I had to place another order but I've got the valves that I need now. So let's go ahead and hook up one of these valves with a double acting cylinder and uh, see it work. So I've got a double acting cylinder here and I have already put a quarter inch uh, push to connect fittings on the cylinder. So those are ready to go. And we're gonna use it with a 5-2 valve. So these two ports on the top need to be connected to the cylinder. I need to connect pressure to the bottom and the other two are exhaust ports for the cylinder. Now this particular valve has uh, eighth inch NPT fittings in it or NT NPT threads in the ports. So I'm gonna use eighth inch NPT fittings to make the connections. And then in addition to the fittings for the pressure and the outlets, um, I also have these. These are exhaust diffusers. They just thread into an eighth inch NPT port and then they have this sintered brass permeable membrane on them that allows the air to escape more slowly and it just muffles the sound so they don't make as much noise when the valve pops open and lets the air out. And we'll try it with and without those and see how that goes. So let me just go ahead and connect these up. And again, these fittings have the pre-applied sealant on them and they're tapered and they're the same spec as the threads in the valve. So they should go in easily and seal up. Yep, and I can turn that in a couple of threads by hand, which is what the spec calls for. And then they start to get stiff as the uh, compound starts to engage. And these really don't have to be that tight. They just have to be tight enough that the a uh, sealing compound gets compressed and makes a good seal. Then we'll connect tubes to the outlets here. Push those in far enough that they engage the O-ring and the spring. Okay, so I think we've got that set and now we just need to get some air pressure on the inlet port. and clip on the electrical leads. Now, what should happen when I switch on the valve is the cylinder should extend, and then when I switch it off, it should retract. Let's see what happens. Yep. 
And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. Now you can hear the exhaust coming out of the ports. And that's only at 30 PSI. So let me go ahead and put in these exhaust diffusers. And these don't need to seal terribly, um, terribly tight. It's okay if they do, but again, it's just exhaust. They don't need to be airtight. And let's see how much different that makes on the sound. Uh, sit, quiet it down a little bit, not a ton. All things being equal, I'd rather have it with those than without, but there's the basics. This is how a 5-2 valve works with a double acting cylinder. Well, that's all I have for today. We will get back to the mill spindle project soon, but this topic created enough confusion that I thought it was worth a video of its own. If you're enjoying these videos, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. I'd like to know what you think. Thank you for watching.